Okay. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Todd Baginski. Uh, my company is called Canvas Consulting. We are based in Seattle. I actually live in Colorado. Uh, I've been working with SharePoint and Office Technologies for about uh, 13 years now. Um, I'm a nine-time SharePoint uh, MVP, and I'm very, very excited to show you all the new way that we can develop solutions with Office and the brand new stuff that Microsoft has today uh, uh, that we can take advantage of. Yeah, and my name is Doreen Brown. I'm a program manager with the Office Extensibility team at Microsoft. I've been with the team for about two years, and we focus on Office 365 extensibility and how you can take your third-party applications and keep them inside of our uh, products. So you want to get started? Yeah. Yeah, let's get started. So before we go into any major details, we need to reiterate on the fact that uh, you can submit evaluations for breakout sessions. Although we were joking about it earlier, we do actually take these evaluations very seriously and it really feeds into what we do for the next conferences, how we improve on these sessions now. So please, 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 if you have the chance, do fill out the session uh, evaluation for this breakout time. But to talk about what we're actually doing in this session, uh, today we plan on talking about what an Office 365 app is. Right, so this is a web application that is registered with an Azure Active Directory that shows up in some way inside of your Office 365 tenancy. We will show you how one works, walk through a few scenarios, uh, build a little bit of it together, uh, talk about how the registration process into Azure AD works, and then talk about a few pieces of Office extensibility that you get kind of for free, uh, or with, uh, for sort of free, uh, with a little bit of extra work inside of the suite. Right, so the key takeaway for all of this, with all the stuff we talk about today, just keep this in mind. Um, with Office 365 web apps, you can create these secure cloud-hosted line of business applications that basically take your, any platform you want, any technology you want. Uh, we pulled the crowd earlier. Uh, a lot of people here are C-sharp, ASP.NET developers, but you could also use JavaScript, Ruby, Python, basically anything that gives you HTML uh, and put it, put it on the web and have it from Office. So you've probably seen this slide so far in the other sessions you have, but we gave it a new name here. And what we we're really showing and what we're building here and showing you how to build today is the real power that you have at your fingertips with the Office 365 platform and all the services it provides you. Um, we are able to call into everything Office 365 has available for us to build line of business applications. And if you've built line of business applications in SharePoint in the past or with Office in the past, I think you will agree after you see the code and the patterns that we use to implement these, how little code you have to write now to do these types of integrations and how easy this is to do. Right, there are a few sessions that touch on some of the APIs. Uh, we will talk about the Office 365 APIs a little bit, but there are uh, a few sessions on the O365 Unified Graph APIs that we recommend you watch after this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's right here. There we go. Right, so here we're just basically showing, you've seen this slide before like a thousand times, but here we're basically showing you that you can actually manifest your UI inside of Office and access all of your user data that way or, again, use these APIs and code and patterns that we're going to talk about to access data for your third-party services. So the demo that we're going to show, uh, when we really get into the more complex demo and we get beyond the hello world examples of how you build one of these apps, is called the Property Inspection Code Sample. It's, it's actually more of a property management scenario. All this code is available in a GitHub repository in the Office Dev uh, GitHub repo. And so the code that I'm showing today is not there yet, but it will be after Ignite next week, once we get a few more things straightened out in it and tighten it up a little bit, and we will publish it then. So everything that you're seeing today is available for you to download and use to build things. Now, you can see in the slide here, there's many different pieces of the puzzle to the property management code sample. Uh, 
It starts out with an inspector and a mobile app. And in this code sample, we have written the mobile apps in iOS. We've written them in Java with native Android. We've written them in Cordova to target iOS, Android, as well as Windows Phone devices. And we've also written them in Xamarin. So we have covered the gamut of every technology you can use practically to build a mobile application. We're not going to touch on that in our session here today. I'll talk about that with Josh Gavant later today at 5 o'clock. But the scenario starts out that an inspector uses one of these mobile apps. And he goes to a property and he conducts an inspection. He uses a mobile app to take some pictures, record some notes about that inspection, and he submits that into the Office 365 services and places to store data. Then, this is where our Office 365 uh, web app comes into play. In this case, the dispatcher for the property management company is going to review that incident that was reported and schedule a repair. The repair person is then going to get an email that they need to go repair this property, and they open a different mobile app, which allows them to get details about the repair they need to do. They conduct the repair, they can take pictures of the repair completed, and they can submit it for approval, at which point the dispatcher comes back in into the Office 365 web app and processes that and says, I approve or I reject this uh, repair. We have everything practically possible in Office 365 being used in this demo. So if you're building apps like this for your company and you want to learn about all those different APIs and how you can take all these pieces of Office 365 and use them, this is a fantastic demo which will give you snippets and patterns to integrate all those types of services. All right, let's go see it in action. Yeah, so without further ado, Let's jump in and take a look at the web app I was talking about. So here is my Contoso property management app. This is an Office 365 web app. And as you can see, it is running on an Azure website right here. When we built it, we actually debugged it against localhost. And then when we were finished, we published it to Azure. There's many different pieces of the Office 365 platform and services in use here. The metadata that you see about the property in the top left here, as well as the picture of the property, that is all stored in an Office 365 private site collection. So we're using SharePoint lists and libraries to store this data. We also have the different members who are members of the Contoso property management company who are interacting with this particular property in order to maintain it, repair it, and inspect it. These members are part of a unified group in Office 365. If I click the link to see more here, it'll actually take you to the out-of-the-box page that comes with Office 365, and I can look at the members of this unified group. And here you can see them. Other things we have inside of here are recent documents associated with this property. We're using the Graph API to go after the recent uh, documents inside of our SharePoint site collections and uh, are part of me inside of the unified group's OneDrive file collection. If I click that one here, you can see the group and the different files that we have there as well. I also have notes here. These notes come out of a OneNote notebook and we'll get into that a little bit later more and, and show you how we're actually writing notes to there and, and listing the notes in that notebook. We are also able to get at the emails associated with the currently logged in user here, the dispatcher account I'm logged in with. As you can see in the top, that's Katie J or Katie Jordan here. So we can get emails and find information out about email. In this case, what we're actually doing is we're getting the emails back and we're filtering them to say, only show me the emails in the list that have been sent to or from the owner of this property. So we have a very targeted list of emails, very specific to the task at hand here. We have another way to look at the files at the bottom, too. And we can even upload files to those unified groups. So I'm going to pick a file right here, which is a GPX file. We're going to use this a little later in our demo today. 
and I'm going to upload that. And it wouldn't be a demo unless that happened, would it? Let me refresh the page and try again. Once I get that done, that particular file is going to appear right here in the unified group. So you don't just have read access to these things. You also have write access. So you can upload files and change files and do different things like that as well. Let me dig back down into that one and give that another shot. And then the other piece of the puzzle we have is the ability to create OneNote pages here. And our OneNote pages, when we create them, we take the metadata about that property that you see up here. All this information is stored in SharePoint, as well as this photo that was taken during the inspection. And we put those into the OneNote. And we also here have a link to a video stored in the Office 365 video portal. So I see why things were doing what they were doing. Let me, basically, my authentication timed out here. Doesn't like that. Can you switch off the screen for just one second? Sure thing. We can talk a little bit more about. I'm just going to come right back to it after I get this. All right, so while we're fixing up the demo, uh, which what we're showing you here is more of what we call a line of business application. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is a single tenancy writing code or a, pro a program, whatever you want it to be, for itself. So this is, I'm a business, I'm customizing my business processes, I'm never gonna put this in a store, I'm never gonna distribute this to others. Right, so this is almost what we see more often, but we do allow for what we call multi-tenant applications. And this is for more of a software as a service scenario where you're creating an app uh, and you're giving it to customers, like a B2C sort of thing. You're writing code for like a customer that's deploying it to their own tenant, but you still want to be able to access it, all that kind of thing. How's the demo looking? We're good. We're good, all right. Yep. So what happened before is pretty much uh, in the speaker room about a half an hour ago, I logged into everything and my session timed out. So that's why we got those errors there. So let's come back now and let's take a first look at uploading that file. So here is the file upload and now I'm going to go upload that file. And here we are calling into the APIs which allow us to interact with the OneDrive associated with the unified group that is associated with this particular property. And so now that the page refreshed, I know it's there, and I'll come back and refresh this page, and you can see I've got my file here now. I'd also like to point out while we're here, we have different groups. So this is like a design decision we made on how to architect this application. You'll notice we have a different unified group for each property that is being managed here. So if you think about things that you build in line of business applications that need to be secured separately or need to have data associated with them uh, separately, you can think of the unified group here as a great storage container for all of that because the group gives you all the things you see here in the drop-down. Conversations, a shared calendar, members obviously on who is a member and who is an owner, a file collection, and a notebook. So anytime you create one of these groups, you have all these things available for you so that you can build these types of web apps or mobile apps and use the APIs to get in and work with the data inside of them. The other thing that I'd like to show is the OneNote, or, where were we? We were on the uh, video, right? Yeah. So if I am showing a thumbnail here of this video that is in the O365 video portal. And I clicked on it there, and here we now have the video. So that's uploaded to the portal. Now we can see the actual video that the inspector took and uploaded via the mobile app to say, hey, here's what's going on with this property. So as you can see, there's just tons of different containers and types of data and structures you can use to build line of business apps. If we come back over, we'll look at one more bit, and this is the annotate images part. So if I click on annotate images, the idea is someone has reported and taken a picture of an incident. And maybe the dispatcher needs to mark up that picture a little bit so the repair person has more information so they can make the repair appropriately. So when I click that button there, I've now invoked 
the OneNote APIs. And I'm creating a new page in that OneNote notebook. And I'm creating it in the section that is uh, created for each property. So when the page comes back, I know that worked. And I had one here before, and what good timing. There's a new one we just created. And so now you can see, you can actually create notes like that. And then someone can come in here, and they can mark it up and say, hey, this is what you need to fix right there. So that, as you can see, there's just a ton of different things we don't have to invent from scratch, and we can just call in to build them. So that's what an Office 365 app looks like. The last thing to point out is how do you launch them? Well, when you deploy an Office 365 app, it shows up in your My Apps page, which you get to by clicking on the App Launcher, and then you click My Apps. And then it's a lazy load. And at the bottom of the page here in just a second, the My Apps for this tenancy will come back. And it'll be listed at the bottom of the page. And that async operation seems to be taking a little time right now. One thing to note about the My Apps, as well as all the apps here, you can actually pin and unpin them from the launcher. So if you create one of these for your organization and you want it to be available for people at all times, all they have to do is pin it, and it becomes available right there. I'll try to F5 that and see if it yeah, comes back this time. sometimes you need a refresh. Time. That's OK. We can come back to it later. We'll see and, it uh, in the next we'll demo as well. We'll see it in the next well. demo. So that's the, the tour of what is one of these things. What can you build with one? So now we're going to show you everything under the hood and really build one and show you how you can get started. Yep. So we talked a little bit earlier about the types of Office 365 apps you can make, right? The single tenant apps for your own business or the multi-tenant apps, which you can actually, as of we're announcing it build, distribute through the store, give to your customers, all that kind of thing. But there's also the question of, I have this app, I've declared it, I want it to access all of my data inside of Office. How do I say, yes, this app can go access all of my data? And what we have is uh, a common authentication and authorization scheme inside of Azure AD, which we refer to as common consent. And if you've ever used the web app before, like Facebook or Twitter, and you log into an app with your Facebook or Twitter account, you'll get a thing that pops up that says, Facebook or Twitter has, wants access to blah, 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 blah. And this is the exact same thing. When you consent to an application, it will ask you, oh, this app wants access to your mail. This app wants access to your files, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you're never giving, you're never unaware when you give permission to a third party application for the data that you want to actually give it. So we're going to step into that right now. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Azure AD management portal and register an app inside of Azure AD. How many folks have created an app in the SharePoint app framework and gone to app reg new file and created an app? OK, this is, few. Yeah. Yeah, this is very similar. And this is the same type of thing. You're, you're creating an app here that's going to define your permissions. And you're going to use OAuth in order to uh, authenticate and authorize your users to use that app. So instead of going to app reg new in SharePoint to register my new app, now what we do is we go to Azure Active Directory. So here's a dev uh, Azure Active Directory that I have. And I'm going to click into there and then select Applications. So this is your step one on where you start in this process. You can see I have many different applications defined here. And to create a new one, you just go down to the bottom and you click Add. And there's a couple different ways to go about this. The first one is add an application my organization is developing. We're talking about web apps in this section, so we're going to pick the web app option. If you would be making like a console app or a Windows app or a native mobile app, you would select the native client application instead. So I'm just going to create a demo app here real quickly. And the sign-on URL is going to be the URL that users are going to go to to access your application. The app ID URL here would be like something like this. It's just a unique identifier. It's important to note that you actually never navigate to that URL. 
in the app ID URI there. It's just used in uniquely identify your app. So click the check mark, and that's going to create your app. Now, the next thing you can do is configure your app to give it the permissions to the things it needs to access in your Office 365 tenancy, and also to set those on a fine-grained level on what you can and can't do with the different services you interact with. If I scroll to the bottom here, you can see right off the bat, I have a Windows Azure Active Directory permission to that application added, and it's set up to enable single sign-on and read the user profile. You have to have that in there in order to do the authentication. So let's say we want our app to do some more different things. For example, the app that I just showed you, it used OneNote. So I needed to give it a permission for OneNote. We also used the unified API. I called it Graph before, but this, this API that allows us to get to all these different services from one stop is called the Office 365 Unified API. So I'm going to pick that one. I need to get the SharePoint data because I had list data and documents and things in SharePoint. And I need to send emails and pull pictures back for people from Exchange and access their email. So those are the permissions that we have inside of the demo application that I showed you. After you pick the different applications you want to integrate with, the next thing to do is define at what level users can interact with those apps. So I can say something like, well, I want it to do everything under the sun with OneNote. Or for SharePoint, I want it to have full control of all site collections. And maybe for Exchange, I don't need such pervasive permissions. Maybe I just need to read a user's email. And so as you can see, these are very granular permission settings that I am giving to my app. And there's a whole bunch of them from the unified API here as well. I'll just pick a couple for demonstration's sake. Yeah. Note that some of, these, some of these permissions are tenant admin uh, permissible only. Right, so you just can't have some user coming in and saying, oh, I'm totally going to give this app permission to all of my site collections, because that user should not have the right to do so. And for more information on what permissions are tenant admin uh, permissible only, uh, please refer to our documentation at dev.office.com. So as you can see, while Doreen was chatting about that, uh, I created my app successfully, and I've given it all these different permissions that I, that I have now. Other things you can do is upload a custom logo here. This logo will appear as that tile in the My Apps page and in the App Launcher. So this is how you brand it and give it a logo so people can find it quickly. You get the client ID here, which you are going to need in order to perform your authentication operations. And then you have to pick a key for it and how long that key lasts. When you save the page, the key value is put right here. So in the past, we called this the client secret. Now it's called the password in the code that we write. But those are your two pieces of the puzzle you need to identify the app. And uh, then at that point, users can authenticate to the app. Based on their user permissions, then they can do the things that we defined down here in our app permissions. One last note on this is, how do I open this up to my users? Right now, the application is secured such that I'll just skip just saving save that. that. Right there, yep. there we go. And here are the users in my tenancy. And so at this point, I am allowed to grant at a per user level who's allowed to open this app. So if you develop an app for the HR department in your company, but no other company is supposed, or part of your company is supposed to see that app, well, just give access to your HR department folks. And then that way, it's secured appropriately. So that's the high level on where you start, how you set up permissions, and create an AAD app. Right, so we do have the Azure AD management portal available for you today. Uh, you can go in and write all the uh, permissions and configuration that you want. But we also provide a series of tools and steps and technologies that it makes it a little bit easier to write your own applications. Right, so first off, and most importantly, uh, dev.office.com is where you learn how to do everything about Office 365 development. We have some getting started resources, sample code, information. It's a great resource. Go check it out. Uh, we also, uh, you can use Visual Studio 2013. Uh, we're going to show you 2015 in some of our demos today. 
Um, but basically, anything 2013 update four and up, you can use to uh, create your applications. And we'll walk through how you can avoid some of the work in the management portal by using Visual Studio instead. <coughs> Uh, if you do use Visual Studio, you should also have the Office Developer Tools for Visual Studio 2013 slash 15. Um, this will give you all the NuGet packages and some additional extra steps uh, that will make it easier to develop these applications. And finally, a subscription to Office 365. Uh, you can go to dev.office.com and join our new developer program, which we'll talk about later, and actually get a free year of a dev tenancy where you can try all this out on your own. All right. Let us create an Office 365 web app together. Switch over to my machine. And I'm just going to show you a very simple, very quick, uh, very, very, very basic web application that authenticates to Office 365. And what I have here is Visual Studio 2015, the new release candidate that was recently released. And uh, I'm going to see how many times I can use the word released in one sentence here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to make an ASP.NET web application. I've titled it Azure AD App. All right, so this can be pretty much whatever you want because it just affects how the code is. Uh, I like MVC, so we're going to go with that. And I'm going to tell Visual Studio that I want to authenticate against my Office 365 tenancy. So I'm going to select Work and School Accounts. And because this is just for me, I'm going to select Single Organization. Uh, this will allow this app to be the single tenancy that we talked about. So this is more I'm making an application for my uh, users in my own business. But if I chose to later, I could make this multi-tenant as well. All right, so we're going to make this cloud. It's like a product or an ISV scenario there, yeah. you know? If you want to allow people to download that from the marketplace and plug it into their tenancy and if that's the case, you want to allow it to work in multiple places, you pick the multiple tenancy one. No download, it's the cloud. Right, Everything's that's in right. the cloud. That's right. Everything's in the cloud. Uh, but yeah, so basically the domain dobrown.microsoft.com is a tenancy that I have set up already. Right, so we're not going to go into that. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in an Azure plus Office demo we're doing this afternoon. Um, and I will give this app permission to read my own directory data. Right. Now, if I chose to, I could actually use the application that we created in the portal by taking the client ID that was generated and pasting it into here. So if you have an app that you're using for multiple resources for whatever reason, or if you've just done all this work already, you can save yourself a few steps. But we're going to go ahead and skip that part. All right, so let's create the app. There was an option on that previous page as well. We didn't check it in the interest of time to make this a little quicker, but if you click the checkbox that says Publish to Azure, it will actually go ahead and create that Azure website for you and publish your app straight to that location. Yep. So you'll, what you'll see here is a very basic uh, ASP.NET MVC app. We can click into the controllers, and you can see uh, you know, account and home and user profile, all of that. But I can actually just F5 this, and we'll launch into something border, actually definitely usable, not even borderline usable. Mm -hmm. So we're starting the build. It'll take a little bit to compile. Uh, you'll get all the cool memory management that you get with Visual Studio 2015. And as we load here, what you'll see is a prompt to log in, because everything is authenticated for this, uh, for this basic app. And so I've made this a single tenant application. So I want, to, I want to log in with a user in my dobrown.onmicrosoft.com tenancy. So you see I have my Microsoft login, an MSA, uh, but I'm going to pick this one. And you'll see that we get this common consent page to pop up. And this app, this Azure AD app, is asking for the permission to read directory data so it knows the who I am. And it's asking to sign me in and read my profile. And without that sign-in permission, we wouldn't even get here. It would just error out. So I'm going to accept that this app can access my data. And we're going to wait a little bit longer for the authentication processes to finish. And when this is done, we'll actually see some data inside of our app. So you see, hello, Doreen at dobrown.onmicrosoft.com. It knows who I am because I'm logged in and authenticated against my Office 365 information. And if I actually go to WAC, user profile, we're pulling data from the graph and showing it inside of our app. 
And we can, you know, you can go in and actually look at all this code inside of the default information inside of Visual Studio. So that was crazy fast, right? That was mm -hmm. less than a minute. You could go from nothing to having running code and accessing all your Office 365 data. And now we'll walk through what it's like for the property inspector code sample, which we talked through the scenarios earlier, and how that accesses data in Office 365. Before we jump to there, let's show them the add connected services piece real quick. Sure. I mean, we really thing. hadn't planned on that, but. That's okay, we can wing it. When we created that, when Doreen created that app right there, uh, she clicked that checkbox before she hit next and, and Visual Studio started cranking out the code template and assembling the project. Uh, she gave it the permission to read the directory data. In that wizard, that's the only permission you can assign it. So if you're creating your AAD app via Visual Studio like this instead of how I showed you in the Azure Management Portal, and you need to use other services, you don't have to go to the man Azure Management Portal, pull that app up and set your permissions there. You can actually set them right here inside of Visual Studio. And so to do that, you ready to go? Yep. All right. I, is it up? I don't think it's oh, up. Oh, my bad, yet. it's not up yet. No problem. One second. So to do that, what you do is you right click your project, you pick add, and you select connected service. Sorry, give us one second, We're running into some connector issues here. All right, that's fun. So we will, uh, here we go. Got it. So inside of the. It's still not there. No, it's not. It's right there. It's fine. Oh, yeah. Very good. So we're all good. <laughs> okay. All right. So there's multiple ways that you can access your Azure AD app information, right? So in Visual Studio 2013, you simply click on Add Connected Service, and all of your data about Azure AD, about um, the permissions you need, that's all there. But in, in 2015, we have slightly different uh, information. If I want to configure my Azure AD authentication, I just right click on my project and select configure AD authentication. And it's a very nice simple wizard that gives you all the information you need to know. Right, so my single sign on is what allows me to log into Office. And if I were in my browser already logged into Office, it would just log me into my app without any further to do -ry. But I can actually give additional directory access permissions here or if I want to grant permissions to other Microsoft products, I can right click and select Add Connected Service. And it'll give me a bunch of different options that I can go and select things in here as well. So you don't need to leave the portal to uh, add permissions to Azure AD or to your app. Uh, you can just you go be entirely in Visual Studio and be ready to go. Mm -hmm. So it makes your life really easy as a dev because you don't have to bounce back and forth between the web browser and Visual Studio all the time. You just live in one spot all day as you build your app. All right, so we're going to switch over now to a separate project. Uh, this is the property code inspector, actually the code. And uh, Todd will walk you through what exactly it takes to build this app. Yeah, so we showed you how to build it. They're very simple, right? We got the hello world wor working. This is the more, this is the code of what I was demoing before of what was pulling from all those different pieces in Office 365. This is the code that is available on the GitHub repository. This exact version of the code, as I mentioned, give it two weeks and we'll have it on the GitHub repository there for you. But what I'm going to do now is walk you through the finer pieces of the code and show you how we authenticate with code, how we uh, call different APIs and return things, and really how simple this is to build. So I'd just like to point out to begin with, here's my web config file. I have a bunch of different settings in here which show me, as you can see, the different resource IDs associated with the different services I'm using in Office 365 here as well as some data, metadata down here, things like about the video portal and which channels we're gonna store different types of videos in. Notice I have my client ID and my password here and my authorization URI. When you do the steps in Visual Studio to create one of these projects, the Visual Studio tooling will actually add those three values for you to your project. The other code that is being added when you create a project like this in Visual Studio that supports the authentication can be found under App Start 
startup.auth. In here, all of the authentication and the OWIN middleware is automatically wired up for you so that you're authenticating to the cloud. You don't have to write any of this. In Visual Studio 2013, the tooling does not generate this. There is no file new project make an Office 365 web app. You will see links in this slide deck that describe how you can go to GitHub and download a starter project and just build on that, which does have all that auth written in it. In Visual Studio 2015, now this auth code is written for you as soon as you finish the file new project wizard. All right. Starting at the top, if I want to interact with any of these services in Office 365, what I need to do is return the access tokens for each service I want to interact with. I can only get an access token back for a service which has been configured for the AAD app associated with this application. So if I didn't pick OneNote permissions and I try to get an outlet to, uh, or an or if, if I don't configure exchange permissions and I try to get an Outlook token, that's gonna fail because I did not tell my app it can use exchange. So as you can see here, this is the method that fires when we go to this page right here. This is my inspection details controller. I'm taking in the ID of my inspection. And if I come back to the code, here you can see there's the ID being passed in. So the first thing that happens when this web page loads is I retrieve my Outlook token, my SharePoint token, and my graph service. We've put in helper methods in here to factor this to the nth degree so that you're not working with the code base as a sample here that's all you know just one big long procedural list of code. We factored this out very well so you can take these exact same helper classes we have created to get tokens and interact with these services and reuse them to help speed your development. You can see if I come into my authentication helper and take a look at get access token async this is essentially the code that's using the ADAL library to go retrieve me that access token. It's not much code, is it? It's very simple, and you only have to write it one time, and then boom, you're done, and you can get that auth token or access token back anytime you want. So yeah, that's much, pretty much, much step one. Much more simple than all the SharePoint authentication you have to build with a SharePoint add-in. Got that yeah. right. And just for the record, as we built this, I reset IIS zero times. <laughs> <laughs> The next thing is we're just gonna start looking at the different patterns of where these APRs, APIs are at today and how you call into these different services. The long-term vision is for that all of these different APIs and, and services that I'm accessing will be accessible via the Microsoft Unified API. We're gonna show some of that Unified API, also referred to as the graph, uh, in here, but right now I'm looking at SharePoint API to get back SharePoint list data. Basically, you can see here I'm using SharePoint's REST API to get the data just like you do now from a SharePoint site. This has not been wrapped in the unified API yet, so that's why I use the SharePoint API here to make a REST call and get my data from SharePoint. The second pattern that I'd like to show you is using the graph here. And so this is the code that we run to pull those files back from the unified group. I create a group using this group fetcher class uh, that comes with Microsoft Graph API. And then I basically say, execute, give me all the files, and then I can pass in a predicate in order to filter those files one way or the other. I mean, that's it, boom. There, I got all the files and those factored out the four lines of code, but really two lines of code, and I was able to retrieve all the files for a given unified group. Very, very simplistic pattern. And then here, after I get the files back, I just process them. You can see we have it coded up such that if you have an office um, file extension, that we are going to have that open up in the WAPI frame in the web browser. If we don't, then we just return the file URL and when you click on it, the browser then handles that as it would any other file of that type. 
The next pattern that we have is getting the groups back via graph. So if I, I need to get a list of all the groups in here as part of the code we use under the hood, that's all it takes. I, now I'm pulling back groups equal to the display name I pass in. That's my kind of API. I don't know about you, but I don't have to worry about anything besides one line of code. It's very simple. I've got my service. Here's the groups collection. Now there's my where clause. And give me the first one that uh, you find that satisfies that clause. Piece of cake. Next thing is getting the videos via the video portal API. So this one is a little bit different. It's not wrapped in graph at this point either. But as you can see, the get videos async method basically take, takes in the name of the channel in the video portal where I've, I know I've stored this video and the incident ID the video was associated with. Then we're going to call out to this helper class we created. And in our helper class, you can see get video async here is using the REST API here from the video portal. So first I go and I get the URL for the channel, given the channel name that I, I took in there. And here is the actual REST call that I'm going to use and send at the video API with today's approach to get those videos. Now I have the channel's uh, URL, and now I can use that channel's URL down here and return the videos for that channel. And so then I parse the response here, as you can see, and I do what I need to do to extract the data from the response and bind it up to my user interface. Again, this is something that in the future, it's going to be graph service dot videos, I'm guessing, dot get videos, and it'll turn in a couple lines of code. Next one is we showed working with OneNote. So when I clicked that button to annotate those images and I stuffed all that data into the OneNote page, here's how we did it. First, I call the get incident by ID async. This is one of the ones that uses SharePoint API under the hood with the REST API to get me the details associated with this incident. Then I'm going to call that method we just looked at to return my videos. Now that I have all that data from SharePoint, the pictures and the metadata about the property as well as my videos, now I can go and create a OneNote page for that. So I'm going to go connect to my OneNote notebook, and here I pass in the name. Uh, then what I'm going to do is return the appropriate section based on which property this is. And then when I'm done with that, and I've got all the metadata and I know where I'm going to put this, I create the page for the incident. This is really neat how you can do this. Essentially, you'll notice we're using a templated page that we created so we can stamp these OneNote pages out over and over very consistently. It's actually one of the MVC pages in the project. And so we create an instance of that page. Once we have that content back, then here uh, is where I'm actually going to use the OneNote API to add that uh, information from here to here. I'm basically punching in all that information into OneNote and getting my response back. So as you look at the code, you can see it's very simple. And you can basically copy and paste what you've got here and change the variables and the content to match. The rest of the code is the proper pattern on how you pass in text HTML and you give it this presentation tag so that one knows how to process that. If we take a look at that template file itself, here you can see it. So that's just an MVC view, which really, if we put them side by side, you can see that's how I created the content in that OneNote page. So that's a deeper dive on what you've got in the code there. As you saw when I showed you the page of the demo, there's a lot more to it. There's SharePoint workflows and all kinds of things going on under the hood. So really encourage you to go check that out. It's an awesome learning resource for you. 
It is. There, there's a version on GitHub that doesn't have this new unified API and graph stuff, but it does a ton of other things and it's available. You can download it, follow the instructions on the README, and, and get it deployed and running in your tenancy. It'll probably take about an hour. Great. So we've done a lot of discussion into how you can use an Office 365 API to connect to a web service running in Azure or AWS or wherever else, right? But what if you could use these resources that you've created and deployed and actually change in line inside of SharePoint, uh, OneDrive for Business, so on and so forth, uh, actually behavior of your files in Office 365? And so we announced this feature at TechEd last fall, but we're announcing in the next two weeks, as soon as the bits actually roll out to your tendencies, a preview refresh of what we're calling a file handler add-in. And this is a type of add-in that is associated with your application created in Azure AD that will allow you to change how files, non-Microsoft files for now, um, how these external file types uh, are previewed, are opened, and how they are represented via icons inside of your browser. Right, so we have a few scenarios that we think are very useful for this, but I'd also love to hear maybe after the talk some, any ideas or questions you have about the feature. Uh, first off, the, our main goal is to reduce friction for you to do work with these non-Microsoft file types. So we're going to show you uh, what we call a GPX app, or a GPX file, right? This is something, if you're familiar with Strava, or who here like goes outside and does things on an occasion? So one or two people? <laughs> Everyone else is coding. Everyone's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know about that. Um, so Strava is a website that allows you to record your runs and biking and all of that. And it'll plot all the points you were at on a map. And you can download that file as a GPX file. And what we have here is this file rendered in a Bing map control. So we'll walk through a demo of this, but it's about 100 lines of code. And it takes you from zero to having an Azure AD-based uh, application that changes Office relatively quickly. Then, once you've actually enabled these files to be viewed and edited, you can add your own company-specific functionality to these files. Right? Let's say I work for a mapping company, and there's some guy out on a truck with a camera, and we're taking these GPX files, and he messes up somewhere. You could, because these are live previews of just your information running, or your endpoints running inside of Azure, uh, actually add buttons and interactivity to these previewers, uh, which is pretty cool, right? So you could, inside of this iframe, actually request corrections to this GPX file using all of the unified graph APIs that we talked about earlier. And finally, and almost very most interestingly, uh, we've worked with some partners on these file handlers, and we've noticed that a common behavior to pop up is using a dummy file to point to third-party web apps um, and the resources that they wish to share. So in one example we worked with for uh, DocuSign, and what DocuSign does is they uh, enable you to electronically sign PDFs or any file type that you want to get legally signed, right? So they'll send a .sign file, which is just a bunch of XML, uh, containing a list of different documents they want signed. And so you can email this out to your, you know, let's say you're a landlord, you're getting somebody to sign your rent. You could create the sign file, email it to them, and then they would actually be able to sign, you know, A, B, C, D, E documents very easily. So for the preview refresh, what we've done is actually incorporate uh, what was previously this file handler manifest into the Azure AD application object itself. So consenting to an app inside of Azure AD automatically lights up this behavior for you inside of Office 365. And so what we've done is created this add-ins property. It can contain any number of extensions, or add-ins, sorry, uh, you want, right? Right now it's just the file handler. But you could create, you know, PDF, PNG, AI, whatever, all inside of one Azure AD app. And we've given it, uh, there's the one file handler extension. Uh, we give it a uh, unique ID so you can actually point out what file handler exactly you are working with. Uh, we say, here's my extension, uh, it's GPX. And then say, here are all the endpoints that I care about that I want to show up in Office uh, when I consent to this application. So things like a link to the file icon, uh, some, HT uh, some HTML that will load in an iframe for a preview, uh, a website that will open when we open a file inside of SharePoint, OneDrive for Business, and rolling out to you very shortly, also Outlook Web App. 
And uh, that data we take. Can you flip over to here real quick? Yeah, sure. We have time to show this. So you might be wondering, where, where is that data? What, she's showing me how this is defined, but where, how do you get to that? Essentially, where you get to that, that is. Actually, we're rolling that out too. It's not actually in that, in that tenant right now. But we're working it, on it. It'll be in here, though, yeah. right? Yeah. So just trying to give you an idea of where that gets registered inside of your Azure AAD app. So if you look at uh, and okay. so basically what we're doing is because this data all lives inside of Azure AD, mm -hmm. uh, right now you won't be able to actually download that manifest and upload it. But we do provide you with graph APIs, like Azure AD Active Directory APIs, uh, to write this data to your application object. And in addition, we are creating some sample code and an app for you to use on your tenancy that will allow you to edit this data yourself until we get that work done inside of the Azure Management Portal. So real quick, uh, we're running low on time and I want to give uh, time for questions, but we'll run through very quickly how these apps work at runtime. First, uh, when a document library is accessed or you're getting into your email, right, that has a file handler or an attachment with these file handlers affecting it, um, the user will click on something that says, hey, I want to interact with this document in some way. Inside of SharePoint, this could be clicking on the file or going to a preview. Um, but basically, we post these activation parameters to the app. So in the post data, we give you a bunch of contextual information, like what workload is calling your file handler, what API should you use to fetch the file, things like that. Uh, then you just go through the standard Azure AD authentication flows, exactly the same as what we talked about earlier. Um, you can get, uh, use the APIs we provide you and the token to fetch the file, and then you can just display it inside of the browser. So to talk a little bit more about this contextual data, uh, we provide a bunch of post form data, and we're rolling out some changes in the next few weeks that will change these a little bit. So I would highly recommend going to dev.office.com and looking at the documentation for this yourself. But in short, you get a bunch of information about what exactly the app needs to run. So the file get and file put, our uh, activation parameters are just HTTPS URIs. Uh, the client is what workload, things like that. So if we swap over to a machine running a file handler, right now I am inside of a group, inside of Office 365. This is the same group that we talked about earlier uh, with the property management demo. And you can see we have some PowerPoint files, some Word files, things like that. Um, we also have here this interesting pinpoint that maybe you didn't notice before. And so if we click on this preview, you'll actually see the GPX file run. And it takes a little while because I'm on demo Wi-Fi. There we go. And you can see here, this is just a custom map control that we've created using HTML5 and JavaScript and it just renders inside of here. But if I go to my mail, we can also see the same app running on this server. And it looks like my email has been deleted, but that's fine. Yep, looks like my email has gone missing, but if I were to have an email with this attachment inside of it, you would be able to see it render side by side in the Outlook attachment view. It's a demo. This things happen. Yep. Yep. But yeah, in the interest of time to give you questions, any time for questions, uh, go build web apps. Go build Office 365 apps. Go extend files using file handlers and reach into OneNote to change your pages and all of that goodness. Uh, MSDN, Office 365, API documentation, uh, MSDN, all sorts of stuff. Go check it out, dev.office.com you will not be sorry. Here we go. Uh, finally, we are launching a build, a developer program for Office 365. And if you sign up, I promise it's not just us sending you spam. You actually get uh, free resources, you get a year of a dev tenancy, you get uh, information to help market the apps you create. Basically, we want to help you create apps from you know, start to finish that you can use to make your business better. So yeah, at Build, sign up for the dev program. Collect your stickers at all the different office events. Uh, we give you t-shirts and books and stuff if you do that. Check out the Express Talks down on the first floor. We're giving basically 15 minute demos of all the different things we're doing inside of Office. And sign up for the dev program.
Great. Evaluate our session. Any questions? Can you put the two slides back on? Of course. This, this one? No, one more. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Great. Any right. other questions? Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat>